Hey legends, I'm Eliza Lee and you're listening to The Making of an Incredible MD, the podcast for aspiring medical professionals. Each week, we'll bring in a current MD student and a practicing physician to talk about an important topic in the medical field. From the effects of climate change to the influence of social media on our health, we'll uncover a maze of different perspectives and end each episode with an ethical dilemma for us all to consider. Stay tuned as we literally hear the making of these incredible MDs unfold right before our ears. Where do I even start with Anna? I know Anna as the fun-loving graphic designing co-founder of Goody, a platform which connects volunteering opportunities with people who just want to do good. But turns out, before all that, she's actually been a dentist for seven years now, graduating from the University of Melbourne's Dental School in 2013 and still practices today in private practice and with the Royal Flying Doctors. Having done so much at such a young age, I thought it was perfect to have Anna on this episode on imposter syndrome. I hope none of my patients are listening to this. (laughs) Thank you so much for hopping on, Anna, and joining us for episode on imposter syndrome, how we're all overcoming it. Where do I start? So I graduated in 2009 from Melbourne Dental School um, and then I worked, or I'm still working as a dentist. I went to rural for two years out in Colac and worked as a dental professional there. Um, And then following from that, came back to Melbourne, worked for a couple of years. Um, Along the way, picked up a few kind of side hobbies as well. So I studied graphic design for a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Amongst other things. (laughs) I also did a bit of work with the Royal Flying Doctors, which was really, yeah, that was an amazing experience. Yeah, in between, I think I've been I've been on a few little breaks as well from dentistry, but at the moment, still working kind of full time in private practice, and, and hoping also to go back to the flying doctors once um once COVID things settle. I mean, before we start, tell us a little bit about what your experience and your stint with the flying doctors was like. Yeah, so I actually so one of the other side projects that I picked up was with Goody, which was a, a volunteering. A platform which basically connects volunteers with volunteering opportunities and I started that up with a couple of other mates back in oh, it would have been two years ago now we were kind of like oh you know a bit fed. I, my, my friend was actually a lawyer and he was really fed up with the whole kind of corporate world and how everyone was driven by profit not purpose and so we really want to help the non-profit space anyway long story short we started this volunteering platform and part of uh, what we did was scale kind of volunteering opportunities for non-profit organizations um, and one of them just happened to be the Royal Flying Doctors so wow. I think I got in contact with I can't remember who it was it was one of the managers there and I said, hey, look, do you guys have any volunteering opportunities? And they mentioned that their dental department was looking for dentists. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up to help volunteer. Lo and behold, it was actually a paid role. So I went in there and, um, yeah, ended up kind of just going in for an interview. I wasn't really expecting it. And, yeah, they ended up hiring me. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but, yeah, the actual experience itself was uh, I, can't, I can't even, like, I would, I'm so grateful for the experience to be able to go. We go out on little kind of week-long trips to areas that are a bit more isolated, so regional remote um, areas that don't normally have access to dental care and uh, provide free service um, for people living out in those areas where normally, you know, they'd have to drive at least two or three hours out to to see a dentist. It's really rewarding. That's amazing. This is like a perfect example because like amongst our friends, we have this thing of like when Anna drops one of her Anna moments and we just find out things about Anna's past that she just like has never told us before. And this is one of them. (laughs) That's a huge thing to do. I love having you on this episode just because you have definitely jumped into so many like side things and like have fearlessly done that and would love to talk about like, I guess, staying on that sort of dental medical profession. Can you tell me a bit about your journey with imposter syndrome in the actual dental medical profession? When in particular you felt it and how does that physically look and manifest for you when you feel self-doubt whenever I felt it uh every day (laughs) 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 because you're super um, young as well 
Uh, I think I get that a lot. Oh, when I first started, actually, I still get this sometimes when I'm working. When I went, <laughs> when I was working out in the country, um, people people would step into the room and they'd start talking to my nurse automatically <laughs> like they're the dentist and they're like doctor I've got this toothache and I'm just in the corner being like hey I'm I'm actually over here guys oh my god um, and there was, I mean I, I just found it hilarious to be honest <laughs> like I wasn't offended I just found it really funny <laughs> and my nurse would be standing on the side like trying to butt in but the patient would just keep talking to her <laughs> I remember there was this other one time when um, I'd done all the work, like I'd actually finished all the treatment for this patient and they they went outside to pay the bill at reception and reception later told me that apparently he stepped out and he was like, she looks like a schoolgirl. <gasps> <laughs> Is she a trainee? <laughs> and I was like, how dare you? <laughs> Um, no, it's, um, I think I just like have a laugh about it because I think I do look quite young as well, um, mm-hmm. which probably doesn't help. Yeah. Um, and going along that stream of imposter syndrome, moments like that don't really help your confidence much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think especially when I first started out, like after dental school, I definitely felt it quite a bit, especially because, you know, we we have our final year in dental school as going out to do rotations. But during those rotations, you've got a demonstrator who's looking or like a qualified professional who's looking over you, over your shoulder and checking your work every time you see patients. And patients go in there with the expectation that, you know, you're you're a student, so they know and they're okay with you getting your work checked. Whereas in that first year out, I think it might be a little bit different to, you know, doctors who go and and interns where you're still in a hospital setting and people know that you're still learning. Whereas when you're a dentist, the first year out, it's like zero to a hundred. You're a qualified dentist now. Right. And so from patient's perspective, there's that expectation that you're a qualified dentist now, regardless of how many years of experience you've had, you're a qualified dentist. And I think there's a hesitation for us, especially because we're a lot more isolated I'd say you know you go into a seat to see a dentist and it's just you the dentist and from a patient's perspective it's just you the dentist and the nurse so as a from from the dentist perspective I, I felt like I was probably a bit more hesitant to ask for help from you know seeing a dentist because that would also look for reflect poorly on mm. you as a clinician from the patient's perspective and that I think was also front of mind so I think that first year out was a little bit hard grappling with that whole idea of like imposter syndrome. Like, am I good enough? Am I qualified to be doing what I'm doing? Yeah. <laughs> because there's always going to be someone that's, that's going to be more qualified for you um, than, than you are. And I think stepping into that space, that really delicate space of knowing that you don't know enough, but then also not letting that get to you um, to the extent where it becomes that whole imposter syndrome thing. So have you like always been like that, that you just naturally don't let those things get to you? Or have you truly had days where it's like, it has gotten to you? Yeah, there's definitely days when it has gotten to me. Um, I'm trying to think of when there's been times that I've kind of like dug myself out of that hole. Because <laughs> it's very much, it's very much like a mindset, right? Like it's, a, it's an internal kind of re- reaction to an external environment. Like the external environment being that, you know, that you're still learning, that there's always going to be someone better than you you know, that there's, you're in a position where there's a lot more at stake, especially as a medical professional. And I think the more that is at stake, the more chance there is that you're going to feel that imposter syndrome, that you're not good enough, that you shouldn't be qualified to do this, this role that someone else should be doing it. Because let's just say if you've got, if you're a surgeon and Mm. you've got someone's life at stake, if you know that you don't have, you know, all the knowledge in the world about whatever surgery it is that you're doing, there's a higher chance that you're going to feel that imposter syndrome because you want what's best for the patient. And I think that's part of it as well. As a medical professional, you always want what's best for the patient. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of that, there's, you know, you feel as though if you don't know enough, you shouldn't be doing this job. And I guess digging myself out of that hole is... <laughs> Actually, I was talking to a friend who's also a surgeon the other day and they said the way that they deal with it is reminding themselves that in this particular moment, at this particular point in time, I am the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. Um, because this person this this client has come to me um or you know this patient has come to me and yeah they've come to me for a reason whether that be you know the training that I've gone through the place that I'm working at or whatever other factors um that's I guess their way of building that self-confidence I think the other part of it is also recognizing that 
everyone's going through it. So I think it's not something that's commonly talked about because, you know, you hear people talking about fake it till you make it. And that's a really right. dangerous kind of space to go into when you're talking yes. about the medical profession. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't fake it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I think there's a, there's a really, like, there's a stark difference between confidence and cockiness and arrogance. Mm. Like, I think when you look at confidence, that's, that's accepting that you don't know everything Mm -hmm. Um, and be willing to and kind of lean into that and be willing to grow and find out rather than letting that get to you and when you go into that space of imposter syndrome that's like letting it get to you and just ruminating over it rather than actually using that to your advantage and use it seeing as an opportunity to grow Mm. Um, so it's like yeah I might not know enough about this but how how else am I going to learn and I think that's part of it too that learning through experience is probably the best way to learn and the only way to do that is just to you know, get over that fear and get over that, that kind of self doubt and just do it. Um, and you most like nine times out of 10, you'll be surprised at how resilient and how resourceful and how adaptive and how quick to learn we actually are. And then going back to that whole idea of, I guess, the difference between arrogance and cockiness and yeah. confidence. I think when we go into that space of like arrogance and confidence, that's when you're like, Oh, I know everything. And that's the, that's the whole like fake it till you make it kind of part, which you don't want to do in, in a medical professional, as a medical professional, because then one, you're stopping yourself from growing and learning because you've shut your mind off to actually the fact that you might not know everything. Um, so as a clinician, you probably will stagnate and then become complacent as well, which mm-hmm. you also don't want. That was a massive tangent. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next thing I was actually just going to ask was like, who and how have you built your own self-confidence as a medical professional? Yeah, I think like everything that I've, like we've discussed just now, plus a little bit of, I guess, working on myself, in, like, pers- pers- like in my personal life, I think that's mm-hmm. actually flowed over into my work life as well. Um, so I think self-confidence is something that I have grappled with for quite some time unknowingly and part of building that is actually kind of looking in internally and being like actually being kind to yourself and just being like it's okay to feel these kind of emotions and like feel inadequate but then whilst accepting it also having the intention to actually to work on it as well Mm -hmm. so I guess in the like working as a dentist part of that is part of that is is changing flipping the mindset and being like it's okay if I don't know everything as long as my intentions are correct. Like as long as I'm intending to to do what's best for the patient, I think that's really important Um, because when you shift the focus from, from being about, you know, competing against other people who have the same job title. So competing Mm -hmm. against dentists who are more senior to you, if you flip that focus onto the patient and what, you know, what you want to achieve for the patient, I think a lot of the time it it takes a bit of the heat off it of feeling that kind of imposter syndrome when you're like actually you know I've gone through training and I I am here as a professional working to serve the community to serve the people that have come to come through that door to seek treatment and you know that's I think once you shift to focus to that it becomes a lot easier to work your way through and it's like yeah I'm going to learn so that I can provide the best treatment for my patients yeah, no, definitely. I cannot relate because I've never been through that process, but I can only imagine what the <laughs> sense of competition is actually like. Um, well, that's the thing, right? Like, because it's, I think it's a lot of it is just comparing yourself to other people. Because, I right. mean, if, the whole idea of imposter syndrome is that you you see someone else that you feel like you're, you're someone that you're not. Right. And how do we get that idea of like, that's someone that we're not. <laughs> it's through comparison to other people, right? Like you've seen mm. someone else and you have this image or perception of what you should be yeah. and you don't think that you're that. Yeah, so I think a lot of it probably stems from competition and probably it doesn't really help. I know, I know a lot of doctors, because like, I've got a lot of friends who are doctors and that work in like surgery, for example, mm-hmm. and for them there's like this whole hospital hierarchy that they have to go through yeah. and they're like constantly telling me like, I'm not enough. I'm not, right. like, I'm not, I'm not good enough. And because they have this hierarchy they're they're also constantly told from their superiors that what they're doing isn't enough. It's not good enough. You need to be perfect. And that whole idea of like perfectionism as well, mm-hmm. um, definitely rings true in, in that kind of space or that sphere, which I've been fortunate enough not to kind of 
have to dabble with too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to segue a little just because, and I, I know I don't have to preface this because we've both very much been involved in the startup entrepreneurial community for quite a few years now. Um, but so in, I guess like in recent times, imposter syndrome for early stage founders has been like a huge topic that has really come to the surface, but it's almost exclusively talked at as like a female founders thing, a female only business events thing just wonder how much of that sort of holds true for the medical professional. Yeah, I guess drawing on my own experiences and the people around me and friends that I've talked to, um, Mm. I think definitely in females, I think it's more stark and apparent. Um, I think it it comes to the surface a lot more, so it's easier to, to see it visibly. But having said that, a lot of my close friends who I've spoken with who are male and working as medical professionals, I think they do actually feel it, but maybe that they don't actually show it as much. Right. So they're better at hiding it. Right. So I think it's I think it's something that happens across the spectrum and across the board. You know, maybe maybe we just deal with it differently. Um, maybe the extent to which we let it affect us um, varies a little bit based on, you know, at whatever biases that we've had or, you know, what are the other previous experiences we've had, yeah, other exposures that we've had growing up, um, which may different, differ a little bit between males and females. Yeah. Um, but I think it's definitely still there, but maybe just to a lesser extent. Um, definitely. So we end each episode with an ethical dilemma um, that hopefully everyone can ponder a bit on. So this one is this week's. If a colleague is underperforming, but you know they struggle with their confidence, how would you have a discussion with them, which is productive without adding to their discouragement? Yeah, I think I just approach it like a rather than seeing them as a colleague, as like a friend. I think the best way to approach it would just be to like open up that conversation, talk to them and not so much focus on the fact that they have, not focus on that as an issue, even though you, you recognise it as an issue, um, but switch gears. If, if there's areas that you've identified that they need help on, just go in straight with it and, um, you know, offer offer help or assistance or just know, let them know that you're there if they need it rather than like pointing blame and saying, like, okay, you're not, you're not good enough at this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and like I guess work on building their confidence, whether that be from like a skills perspective, like if they're not confident enough because they don't have the adequate skills or they don't know like what to do in certain scenarios or situations, if you're if you feel that you have something to offer, then just offer it. Like when that when you see that and you kind of want to help, but then also it's a fine line because you don't want to overstep your boundaries and be like, I know everything. I'm here, like, you know, I'm better than you, kind of like you don't want to impose that on them. Right. So I think it's like coming at it more from a collaborative approach and be like, hey, let's learn together. Maybe that's like, maybe that's a, a way of doing it. Right. Be like, yeah, I'm also like lean into it. As Bene Brown says, <laughs> go <laughs> into it with them rather than be like, yeah, I'm on the outside looking in on you and you need help. So I'm going to help you. It's more like, hey, we're in it together. We're both yeah. feeling like, you know, you know, recognize that maybe you also, like, if you do also have, problems with self-confidence or you know are also grappling with this which I think everyone is to some extent be like hey it's okay um let's work on this together or like let's learn you know a new skill together or whatever it might be that's like causing them to have those um those self-doubts got nuggets of gold and reflection I think we all took away from Anna hope you enjoyed that and can't wait to hear back from Sarah next week to talk about her perspective on imposter syndrome as a third year medical student see you then